Lord Fusitor, how are you? Uh, very well, thank you, Peter, considering. Uh, yeah. still, uh, still in hospital, but not uh, too long to go now, so it's all good. You look kind of like uh, the guy in Moana from here with your <laughs> impressive... Yeah, I, I, have to, I always have to apologise at each of these. Uh, I've got a, a medical cream all over my back, uh, which... Yeah, it makes wearing a shirt or a gown a little bit sticky all day. So everyone's been uh, very uh, uh, kind and, and politely accepted my my very informal attire. I don't mind it. I think you're the only person I've interviewed with more tattoos than me. That's probably true. Shall I get mine off? Do you know, I should just get mine off. Should we do it together? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Let's do it together. Absolutely. All right, here we go. Hold on. Fuck it. Love it. Be the most tattooed absolutely. show I've ever done. Right, Absolutely. All right, man. Well, listen. You've uh, seen every time I seem to go on Twitter. Uh, yeah. You're in Twitter spaces, waxing lyrical, right. getting in there with the plebs, talking Bitcoin. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. It's a great community to be part of. Well, listen. There's a lot, a lot I want to talk to you about. Um, but I think, I think we should educate people a little bit, a little bit about Tonga. I mean, I know where it is. Um, yeah. Yep. I, uh, I know you're a, you're a feeder island for the New Zealand rugby. International team, yeah. they steal your best and, and the Australian and the Australian rugby team. Yeah, we'll talk about that as well because I think that's bullshit. But anyway, tell people about Tonga. Like, let's like tell me. I mean, all I know is the area is you're huge. I won't want to fight any of you, but tell me about it. <laughs> um, yeah, so Tonga is uh, a small island kingdom in the South Pacific, uh, northeast of uh, Australia, New Zealand, southwest of Samoa and Fiji. Um, it's, uh, as I said, it's a small island kingdom. So uh, along with Ethiopia, the only BIPOC nation uh, that hasn't uh, been colonised in its history. So it's something we're very fortunate and, and very proud of. Uh, the royal family that uh, rule us now, uh, His Majesty the King, is a direct descendant of our first king uh, in 1850, in 850 AD, rather. Wow. Uh, so for over a millennia, uh, they ruled peacefully over us. Um, we're a population of about 100,000. Uh, we are extremely migratory race, so we've got uh, close to double and a bit over that uh, in our diaspora, uh, which, as you know, is significant uh, for remittance reasons. And uh, our traditional economy is uh, agriculture and fisheries, a little bit of tourism because we were never colonised. Um, uh, it's kept us owning our own country but also never had the colonial money that came in and built up uh, infrastructure uh, that most of the islands do. So we're probably... Uh, slightly behind uh, Fiji and Samoa in uh, infrastructure rollout. Uh, but uh, fortunately, the important infrastructure, which is uh, internet connectivity, uh, we're extremely uh, far ahead on, so that's good. Um, uh, for myself personally, uh, I'm uh, a barrister uh, by training and by vocation, but uh, a politician by uh, career uh, choice and uh, uh, by fate also. Uh, my father um, was the Lord Member who held my seat and when he passed, uh, I received, uh, as per our constitution and our succession laws, uh, the title uh, along with uh, uh, the estate and uh, I took his position. I was voted in, elected by my fellow Lords in uh, my island group uh, to replace him in, in the Legislative Assembly. So, <laughs> excuse me, um, when we took on a uh, Westminster uh, constitutional monarchy model and uh, uh, were Christianised by, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the first king in the current dynasty uh, in the early 1800s, mm -hmm. Uh, he promulgated a constitution in uh, 1875 and formalised our, our ancient Tongan traditions uh, combined with the, the new Christian faith that we had uh, and uh, a British-style uh, Westminster constitutional monarchy. So we've got uh, one unicameral house, which sort of has 
a House of Lords and a House of Commons all wrapped up in one uh, legislative assembly. Uh, so uh, that's where I work. Uh, there are nine uh, Lord members and 17 uh, people's representatives. Uh, in 2010, when we became a full democracy uh, and His Majesty the King at the time divested himself of all his executive authority, uh, the new uh, remodelling made sure that uh, there were 17 people's reps so that uh, the members elected by universal suffrage could always form a government. Uh, in a House of 26, 14 is a majority, so they could also always form a government if they desired or uh, form one with the, the Lords uh, in a government of national unity. Uh, and that is the case at the moment. So, uh, yeah, we're a, we're a full March, April, May, June, uh, 15 months into COVID and we've had uh, locked borders since March uh, 2020, which fortunately um, has kept us... Uh, on the list of five nations that are still COVID-free, but uh, has kept uh, a lot of us uh, locked out of the country. So, Yeah, and obviously um, kept probably harm the tourism money that you make. Very much so. So no tourists, therefore uh, no customers for restaurants, resorts, uh, no extra disposable income being spent at the ancillary uh, economy in in stores, etc. So yes, unfortunately, COVID hit. Therefore, uh, this economic downturn, and just for good measure, we got hit with a Category Five cyclone uh, within two weeks that the COVID lockdown began. Uh, mm -hmm. Ourselves, Vanuatu, and Fiji. So it was a it was a double whammy for us. And um, I must say, uh, the Tongan government, the Fijian government. And the Vanuatu uh, government and peoples have shown uh, some great resilience to pull through those two things in the past year. Uh, wow. Yes. Yeah, that's a lot. Well, to put the uh, population perspective, the town I live in, Bedford, is 172,000, and Wick is a um, small town. That's more than our population. So, yeah, yeah we could probably fit us in, all in Wembley. Uh, yeah, well, you could, yeah, <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you go on the pitch as well. Um, how, big, how big is the island? Uh, so it's about 738 square kilometres of uh, total land mass, uh, 169 islands, uh, 36 of which are populated. So uh, all that ag those aggregated uh, islands in the archipelago is about 700, 750 uh, square kilometres. But um, as with all archipelago nations, uh, an EEZ, which is uh, 200 kilometres around your outer borders, uh, puts us within a 700,000 kilometre EEZ. So that makes up the, the borders of the nation. Right. Okay. And, and is there a capital island? Uh, yes. There's a, there's a main island, which is called okay. uh, Tongatapu. Uh, that's the main island. And on it uh, is uh, the capital city of Nukualofa, which literally means uh, the city of love. Nice. I'm going to have to visit them once once you're allowed, allowed people in. Yeah, and uh, as you can see, they don't frown on people with lots of tattoos, so you'll be most welcome. I'll be most welcome. I'll have to get one there. You have to take me. I get a local exactly. traditional one. Yeah. All right, so, All right. so the economy is mainly based on tourism and fisheries. Have, have during this COVID period, have you been able to continue exports okay? Well, I'll, I'll put that in context for you. Okay. Uh, the part that is uh, generated, the part of our uh, uh, economy that's generated by local industry is dominated by uh, agriculture, fisheries and tourism. But the, uh, the, the economy as a whole uh, is dependent to a large extent on uh, uh, foreign remittances by right. our uh, diaspora abroad and by a lot of foreign aid, as with most developing nations. But, yeah, absolutely. Uh, the part that's generated domestically is uh, agriculture, fisheries and tourism. And uh, yes and and no, really, the, the exports have, uh, haven't been too, uh, yeah, 
two flash also because with the, the borders shut at the airport, that means borders shut at the Warhols. Right, so how has the country uh, survived economically through this? Because uh, if I compare to like the UK, we have a fairly strong yeah. economy, we have a fairly strong currency, um, we yeah. have borrowed significant amounts of money from uh, our central banks. Um, and that's just something, we, that's a lever we're able to pull. And, uh, you know, whilst we might see certain increased inflation, it is something we can do. We have that right. ability to dig in. How has uh, Tonga survived with this? Uh, we've survived with a, a large amount of foreign aid mm-hmm. and the is from our, our citizens overseas. So those two have been the lifeblood uh, of the economy since COVID. Uh, we're very fortunate to have some great uh, bilateral and multilateral partners uh, who've, uh, over the years, have had a great relationship with Tonga. Um, as with most of the Pacific, you will, if you do not already know, you will likely learn uh, that infrastructurally, uh, the, pro- the infrastructure rollout continues, uh, largely financed by grants or loans from China. Ourselves, uh, uh, you can go down the whole Samoan waterfront and every government building from end to end uh, is built by China. Uh, we're not quite at that stage yet, but uh, in in the uh, world of foreign aid, um, the Five Eyes uh, traditionally uh, have not done infrastructure for quite a while. So China and uh, Japan are the only uh, two countries and the EU, to a lesser extent, uh, the only places that do infrastructure still. So when you're uh, in need of hospitals, schools uh, and roads, uh, yeah, you, those are the ones you, you pretty much have to lean on uh, in our part of the world. And, and people who tend to leave Tonga, is there like any uh, pattern with maybe younger people who want to maybe move to like an Australia or New Zealand or somewhere else to go to yeah. college or to work because they have a, you know, I, I imagine there's like a limit to the range of careers available in Tonga. Right, right. So um, Tongans are a migratory race. Uh, as I said, our diaspora far uh, exceeds the people on island. Uh, or Polynesians are all migratory. Uh, that's how we got there in the first place. Uh, we, we went sailing, exploring from Southeast Asia and, and South America. Uh, so our birth rate has been equivalent to our death and migration rate since about 1940. So our population has stayed completely stable. Uh, and there's, uh, yeah, there's a great migration rate. Migration rate for people uh, who may not have upskilled themselves in Tonga but are looking for... Uh, employment overseas and an opportunity uh, for uh, a better life for their families, uh, educational opportunities overseas, employment overseas. Uh, There's definitely um, uh, an inverted commas brain drain. Uh, Our students, uh, we have a national university, which is a very recent occurrence and isn't a a comprehensive university. So, uh, yeah, historically, uh, going to to university has meant going overseas. And uh, with uh, an average wage that in the early 2000s was between uh, $70 and $100 a week has improved greatly. Uh, That has meant uh, very few private students. The majority of students who... uh, study abroad, uh, go through government scholarships. Uh, The father of our current king, when he was uh, Prime Minister and uh, Minister of Education, uh, uh, the origin, uh, the the current king is Tupou the sixth in this current dynasty. Tupou the first is considered the father of modern time. The current king's father, Tupou the fourth, is considered the father of Tonga as we see it today. So he instituted um, a commodities board that uh, built an export industry for us, Uh, but uh, most importantly for our country, he instituted a a high-quality public education system. 
uh, and a great uh, focus, which is become integral in our culture, on education. So education locally, and uh, every child will be told uh, as they grow that you've got to get a good education here, matriculate and get a scholarship overseas, uh, become university trained, and therefore uh, be able to access the job market from a better position. Uh, so that that impetus uh, has been so strong that uh, if you check the Guinness Book of Records, Tongans have the highest number of PhDs per capita on the planet uh, because of that. Yeah, because <laughs> of that, of the, the fact that education became ingrained in our culture. Uh, so absolutely, as you said. Uh, a large uh, uh, influx of students into uh, Auckland, Sydney, uh, San Francisco, Los Angeles, uh, and Salt Lake City. <laughs> there, are, there are a lot of Tongan Mormons. So, a lot yeah. of Tongan Mormons. <laughs> That's funny. So, so is that where is, is that what drives a lot of the remittance? People go abroad. They, they study abroad. They get their careers abroad, but they they want to support. Uh, their country, they want to sort their, support their family back home. Absolutely. So the entire structure of our country is built on the nuclear and the extended family. So in our culture, uh, the father is the head of the household and the mother is uh, has the social ranking as a female. Uh, then those nuclear families, your nuclear family and those of your siblings are grouped into an extended family which are presided over by and what we call an ulumotua or an elder, a male elder, uh, who calls the shots for the extended family. Those extended families are then grouped into uh, a village, a number of extended families into a village, presided over by a lord whose, uh, whose estate the village will uh, constitute, uh, or he may have more villages. Uh, and then... Those lords' villages are grouped into clans because the lords uh, are grouped into uh, clans as they are uh, in uh, the UK and Europe uh, historically. And then all those clans are grouped into a nation under uh, uh, His Majesty, who's who's the figurative father of the nation. So that structure um, is, yeah, nearly a two millennia uh, on in our country, and is the basis for the the remittances back. Um, it is it's considered um, anathema to our culture to go abroad and not send money back. Uh, it would yeah, it's it's frowned upon uh, for someone to sever themselves from that uh, those familial ties. And you've got uh, Tongans three generations in have never been to Tonga but are raised in our culture overseas and still send money back. Uh, so, yeah, it's the lifeblood of our country. And do the clans all get on? Uh, they do now. They, they uh, do now. Yeah. <laughs> in the old days, uh, yeah, that, that, that image behind me would have been uh, one of the warriors uh, dressed going into battle uh, for his clan. Wow. And... Uh, yeah, so, yeah, now uh, it's on uh, traditional occasions uh, like uh, a coronation or the installation of a, a new Lord's title that uh, the clans gather uh, in their, uh, their traditional groupings and they each have traditional roles. There's a clan uh, of navigators, there's a clan of uh, artisans, there's a clan uh, of warriors. So, yeah, not too dissimilar from from uh, cultures around the world. And, and is everyone hardcore tatted up like you? Is it, is it pretty, is every guy do it? <laughs> there is, they, they are now. So uh, you, you may have seen the Samoan tattoos uh, from yeah, the stomach down to the knee. Mm -hmm. uh, that we had those as well. But when our king became a Christian uh, in the 1820s, uh, the missionaries had a great influence on him and on the formation of our, our national structure and particularly our legal system, uh, our constitution and uh, initial laws. 
And uh, in 1839, the very first code of laws for Tonga um, at their behest uh, outlawed tattooing and any of the uh, our traditional, in inverted commas, uh, that's the word they used in the in the section of the statute, the pagan uh, uh, festivals uh, of our ancient gods. So uh, the the Christianity we adopted was a uh, Victorian era British middle class uh, Methodism. So high collars, long sleeves, dresses down to your ankle, uh, modesty, uh, all measure. So anything that showed um, the sort of uh, robustness of Polynesian culture became reined in and very uh, middle-class Methodist. <laughs> yeah. Mm. yeah, it's precisely so. To your question, mm. yes, now in the past, since the mid-90s, a number of us uh, have taken part in a renaissance of our, our tattooing culture and reclaimed it and have gone through uh, the archives studying uh, because now we only have, uh, ironically, uh, sketches done by foreigners okay, of wow. uh, our old tattooing traditions and those that's what we've had to go on uh, to reignite it. Yeah. And politically, how does it work? Is it... Do you have parties like we have in the UK, which are no. in different positions? So it doesn't work like that. No. So the the name for Parliament uh, in Tongan is Faleaulea, which means uh, the the discussion house. Uh, Polynesian cultures, you'll find Samoa, Hawaii, New Zealand, Tahiti, uh, are ruled uh, by consensus. So it's not a process of two adversarial ideas uh, battling it out uh, for primacy and uh, having then uh, a platform that is shown to the population and they vote accordingly. Uh, We, until recently, we were a constitutional monarchy, but one in which the monarch held uh, executive authority. So... Previously, His Majesty uh, appointed the cabinet ministers from, uh, similar to the US, from outside of Parliament. Uh, the cabinet uh, was made up of technocrats, so people who were were who well trained in their field. He'd basically go, uh, "Who's the, the most? Uh, who's the best Tongan lawyer on the planet? Uh, go and find him, and he'll be the Minister of Justice." Uh, whoever's who's the most qualified economist, Tongan economist on the planet, find him and, and we'll make him Minister of Finance. So the cabinet was traditionally uh, technocrats and a number of older chiefs uh, who uh, the nobility have always been there as, uh, as a sort of steadying uh, cultural influence. Uh, the... Uh, uh, the, uh, to put it mild, the grunt work was left to the technocrats and they were there sort of to oversee and say, um, yes, that, that, that melds well with uh, our long-term cultural policies or that doesn't. Uh, and then in 2010, uh, His Majesty, uh, King uh, George V at the time, who's the first person since Charles I. Uh, well, actually, Charles I had Cromwell at his heel, so you'll have to go back to uh, the Roman Empire. He's the first absolute monarch uh, to give up uh, executive authority just because he thought it was the right thing to do, <laughs> uh, basically. Um, yeah, bloodless transition into democracy. He decided, uh, all right, I think it's time to modernise and we'll, we'll become a full democracy. So he divested himself of all uh, authority. And the current king is just as Queen Elizabeth is, uh, is a a ceremonial monarch Mm -hmm. uh, with all executive authority now vested in uh, the prime minister and cabinet, in the executive and in the legislature uh, from whom cabinet is chosen. Uh, 
So in our house, as I said, there are nine lords elected amongst ourselves and 17 people's reps elected uh, uh, by universal suffrage by the, the rest of uh, the country. Uh, then when the 26 of us vote, uh, are elected, we then come into parliament and amongst ourselves we'll nominate someone for prime minister. Uh, there can be a number of nominees and it's basically a round robin knockout. Whoever ends up with the most votes becomes prime minister. So the prime minister is chosen from one of the 26 elected uh, officials and that prime minister will choose another 12 from within parliament to make up his cabinet. So no political parties, everyone is an independent in the people's representatives uh, and the Lords also. And so it's, as you would expect, there's a bit of um, what they call horse trading go, that will have to go on. Uh, a guy will say, all right, if you guys elect me Prime Minister, I'll make sure you are in charge of uh, construction or you're in charge of finance. Uh, that's that's in real terms how the system as written has to play out. Uh, so currently we have a Prime Minister uh, from uh, the People's Representatives and a Deputy Prime Minister from the People's Representatives uh, and a Cabinet of 12 made up of a collection of uh, Lords and People's Representatives. All right. Let's talk about the remittance stuff then because obviously that is a very obvious and easy win for Tonga if if you can reduce the fees on that it's just such an obvious idea talk to me about well actually before we do that how long have you been kind of aware digging deep into the bitcoin thing digging deep uh, probably the last three years aware since 2013 uh, in 2013 uh my cousin, who's like my brother, um, uh, we taught each other to code in basic. I don't know if you're old enough to remember Sinclair Computers, a of British course, computer company. Yeah. So I, we taught each other to code in basic on a Sinclair ZX Spectrum in 1980. I remember, I, remember yeah. I, mean, I, I had a BBC, but uh, I remember the ZX Spectrum because my friends had one. Yeah. You'd, With you'd a calculator kit. Yeah, and when you wanted to load a game, you had to use a cassette. And you would That's wait right, to and work. you had to flip the cassette over yeah. halfway through some... to get the rest of the data. And like after like 20 minutes, it will fail, and you're like, shit, I'll have to do it again. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, my cousin and I were into it. He's had moved to America, so he rang me up in 2013 and said, there's this great new uh, protocol, this technology that yeah, you're, you're going to be into. Um, there's no way you can get it there, but uh, I'll get us some. Uh, and he explained to me uh, sort of what it was about. Um, I had a look at the white paper. Um, I, I sort of thought I'd gotten my head around it. Uh, I, I found out much later that I hadn't got my head around it <laughs> yet. We all have that. Uh, yeah, and he um, so he got us some, and then eventually he came to Tonga. And I was like, so uh, the Bitcoin, uh, what's the deal? Uh, give it to me. I want to see how, how it works. And he was like, um, so about that, uh, it kind of, the price went up a little bit and I was kind of drunk and a little bit less money than I thought I was going to have at the time and I kind of <laughs> sold it. And I was like, well, brilliant. That's absolutely no use to me whatsoever. Uh, so, yeah, that was the first dangling in front of my eyes that was ripped away uh, very unceremoniously. And then about three years later, I was already in Parliament. Um, as you're probably aware of, being through South America a lot, uh, we have a phenomenon of uh, English, uh, of, of American businessmen, usually in a Miami Vice-type suit that fly through the 
uh, developing world telling uh, us locals of a great idea that's going to make millions for all of us. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so one of those came through. He actually had some good ideas about agriculture, which didn't end up going ahead, but uh, that's not the end or there. Uh, and he's, he was a Bitcoiner. And he advertised myself, not just myself, but a number of the other lords uh, to invest money with him. And he'd go back to the States and uh, we didn't realise whether you could buy it from Tonga or not. Uh, he made, uh, our understanding from him was that at that stage, no, we couldn't. But he would go to the States with the money that we invested in him and uh, he would get us some. And I advised the guys uh, I've been exposed to this technology before. It's 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 the real deal. Uh, still not really having any idea about Bitcoin. <laughs> um, so let's invest. Uh, so we did, and we found out much later that the amount we invested, or well, I found out much later, it was nowhere near the market price of the asset at the time. <laughs> but um, as these gentlemen often do. Uh, he very graciously uh, bade us farewell and yep. disappeared for the sunset, uh, never to be seen again. <laughs> so that was the second time he was dangled in front of me. Uh, and then two years ago, I got very, very ill. Um, I, I actually died clinically in time oh, they had shit. to revive. And uh, the surgical resources and staff on island at the time uh, weren't uh, sufficient enough to be able to give me the surgery they needed. So they kept me alive for 36 hours while they searched the Pacific for an air ambulance. Uh, they tried New Zealand, couldn't find one. Tried Sydney, couldn't find one. Then they found one in Brisbane. Uh, so that flew to Tonga and... They, I was just about to really, really cark it. My vitals were about at 10%. And the air ambulance got there and got me out just in time, straight into Auckland. Uh, and the OR staff were practically on the tarmac, um, I'm told. So uh, they rushed me into surgery, um, three surgeries over a period of two two days where I clinically died again and they revived me. Um, so any any disbelief in miracles I had prior to that were dispelled after this experience. So Damn. I collapsed in July in Tonga and I woke up in New Zealand in September uh, after two months in a coma. Very fortunately, they gave me uh, life-saving surgery. Amazing. Uh, but... Yes, uh, but then it was a six-month, uh, pretty long grind in hospital uh, just to get back to health enough to sit up and stand up and take a step. Uh, so six months on your back, um, yeah, barely being able to lift a mobile phone to at least uh, play a game or something. Uh, basically just lifting the screen up. Uh, yeah, not too much to do. So ended up reading every uh, printed word I could find that was ever printed about Bitcoin uh, or published online, uh, every moving image or word recorded as a broadcast about Bitcoin and spent, yeah, the rest of that year just studying it. Wow. And I got my head around the technology enough, I, I thought, I hope, uh, to have a good grasp of it and began investing myself. Uh, and uh, what that uh, journey taught me was that, as uh, all Bitcoiners know, uh, this is the most pristine asset and the soundest money uh, that uh, mankind has ever produced. And uh, that it, it was uh, for the first, the first world, the developed world, uh, it would be um, an asset uh, which uh, would appreciate in great value and get great returns for that person. 
and possibly be the foundation uh, for future wealth. Uh, but in my part of the world, it would be much more than that and it would mm. be much more than that right now. Uh, I wouldn't have to wait five years for the returns of what Bitcoin could do for people in a country like mine right now. So, because, Why is that? Because of the remittance industry. Let's and talk about the extent, that. Yeah, the extent of our dependence on it. Because so I've as been, you... Uh, well, I think you were about to say the same thing. I mean, I know very well El Salvador. You know, I've been out there. I've been uh, exactly. looking at that project, and I know it's like fifteen percent GDP. I know how much they're kind of losing in terms of remittance. How much of a problem that is. And then you and me are on a spaces, and you were like something like forty-one percent. Is that correct? Forty-two? Can't remember. Yeah. Forty-one. So forty point seven. Forty-one. Yeah. Yeah. Forty-one percent of GDP yeah. is remittance. Of GDP. Nearly and half does, of the GDP. Does that come in as dollar, all different currencies? Does it come in as like US dollars, Aussie? Aussie? Yeah. Aussie dollars. So Aussie dollars, US dollars, New Zealand dollars. Those are the three major uh, sources. And when you're in Tonga, because you do have a, a local currency, is it pr pronounced the Paanga? Paanga, exactly. Perfect. Yeah, Paanga. Well, that's a, that's a good read for me. But, but is it similar to like... Uh, when I went to, say, Cambodia, they have the local currency and the dollar and Venezuela, and you can pay yeah. in the Bolivar and the dollar. Will restaurants accept, you know, all three? Uh, no. So restaurants accept the Bahanga. Um Most will not accept the dollar. Uh, but if they do, uh, it's usually at, at uh, shops, sort of corner stores, they'll accept the dollar but they'll accept it dollar for dollar. So one US dollar, which is actually worth nearly three Tom and Banga, uh, they'll only take it at face value. So, uh, yeah, the country has been encouraged since the inception of our, our currency to uh, transact only in our currency. Right, so, okay. yeah. Do, do, uh, how, how does it, how, what is the state of the current currency? Is, is it... Um, inflationary? Is it fairly stable? Uh, well, it's artificially stable. It's pegged to five other currencies. Right. Okay. So it's pegged to the US dollar. It's artificially pegged to the US dollar, the Australian dollar, uh, the NZ dollar, the, U the euro, and the GBP. Right. Okay. But is there like an underground use of other currencies anyway? Do people tend to hold them to store value under the mattress? Or uh, yes, yes, but yes and no. Uh, particularly more so uh, because 5% uh, of our population is now ethnically Chinese naturalised uh, citizens. Uh, uh, it first began in 97 when uh, Hong Kong was going back to China a number of uh, Hong Kong uh, merchants uh, fled with their, their money uh, looking for somewhere overseas. Uh, many of them came to Tonga. Uh, and then Tonga had, as New Zealand and Samoa and Kiribati, Fiji, uh, our neighbours in the Pacific, we all have uh, a citizenship path for uh, investment. So uh, a lot of Chinese... Uh, from Guangzhou uh, have come to Tonga uh, as and become citizens through an investment path. Uh, and those ones are therefore followed. Uh, so the numeric uh, volume of Chinese are the ones who work for those those people. So poorer Chinese, poorer Chinese have followed uh, and they're the ones that make up the bulk of that that five percent. So in a country of a hundred thousand, Five percent is only five thousand, but uh, that's a lot in a small country. So yeah. they uh, they completely dominate the retail sector because they can get uh, cheap goods from China. Uh, they have connections to obviously ethnic connections to China. They can get goods cheaper than any uh, Tongan merchant can. Uh, and then what Chinese communities often do is uh, they uh, group together into the guild guilds of sorts, and they all order in bulk as one guild. So that even makes it cheaper than separate uh, wholesalers ordering 
So at that price, uh, no Tongan uh, retailer could survive. They undercut them beginning in the late 90s. And by 2010, there wasn't a, a Tongan uh, corner store anywhere in the country. Has there that caused few, any uh, animosity? Very much so, very much so. It's, that's caused a fair bit of tension. Right. Uh, in the only um, the only riots our country has ever seen, uh, we'll get to it later why the riots mm. occurred, um, because of uh, public servants who got pay cuts as uh, World Bank, IMF, austerity measures, uh, but we'll get to that. Uh, yeah. Yes, um, yeah. Uh, those, they were targeted. Um, and uh, any uh, petty crime is usually targeted at them. Uh, we've, got a, we've got a pretty bad um, uh, meth problem with the youth at the moment. Right. Uh, Not good. Yeah, primarily because... Um, most of uh, Sinaloa, Kelly, uh, and Medellin product comes through uh, the Pacific Islands uh, as a transshipment area, uh, both to Australia and to uh, the American West Coast. Um, the majority of my parliamentary work is done in anti-corruption um, uh, with an organisation called GOPAC. Uh, it's the Global Organisation of Parliamentarians Against Corruption. So we're kind of the legislative arm. And the UNODC, uh, United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, is the executive arm. So, uh, yeah, we. So when you get KYC AML'd, that so that data can come to us, and we can track the illicit financial flows uh, together with NATO uh, when stuff's headed to the Middle East, uh, and together with uh, Interpol for this uh, product that's coming, the China white that's coming out of China to head towards the US and uh, the blocks uh, of uh, Bolivian marching powder that are, are coming back the other way. Right. Uh, so that being the case, as a transshipment destination, it was inevitable that uh, the local population would get uh, exposed to it. And uh, because it's coming through us in bulk, uh, it's very cheap. Uh, and, yeah, we've had to... Our annual uh, police uh, ministry budget is $5 million. Uh, it's, uh, our, our army is largely ceremonial. The police are more... Um, uh, less uh, police in crime and more helping in disaster relief where... Uh, villages get flooded or things like that. But that's in, been increased this year to 50 million uh, from five, specifically just to, to combat uh, the meth problem. Wow, so, um, yeah, so that's an issue for us. Uh, and, uh, yeah, where a lot of the remittance money goes uh, for, for youth. Uh, and we've had um, uh, international crews come through and interview um, local dealers anonymously with the voices changed and the faces mm -hmm. blacked out. And some of their admissions are pretty, uh, yeah, pretty stark. They say uh, their customers go all the way up to the top and to church ministers um, who are extremely revered in our community, second only uh, to the Lord in a village, so, yeah, that's, that's a great problem for us. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Say, let's get, well, I was just going to say, let's get, I think you're about to do it. Let's get into the numbers of the, rem, the remittance so people understand. Yeah, so 40.7%. So 40. 40. What, what does that mean in real terms? In real terms, uh, that's about, in a, uh, a national GDP this year of 510 million, 250, that's about 200 million. Wow. And how much of that is lost to the remittance companies? Uh, about 19%. So the 40%, we get about 21% in real value. Uh, when you take, when you calculate the 30, the on average 30% chunk that they take a bite out of, as Jack Mallis said in your interview in El Salvador, it can be upwards of 50. Uh, 
uh, it's it can be 10 also. So averaged out, we did the numbers, it's about a 30% average. So at that 30%, that's about... Um, 60 million. Yeah, yeah. So that at that 30 difference. Uh, no, no, at that 30%, it's... Um, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Precisely. Yeah. Really. So that, would, that would make a huge difference. Make a huge difference. So of the 41, of the 40%, uh, we're actually only re re uh, receiving 21% because 19 of that is is taken out by Western Union. Mm. So uh, the 19% um, is, yeah, it's, that's, that's fairly life-changing. So, yeah, because there's, there's a couple of things here that I'm thinking about when I think with regards to what I've seen in El Salvador. There's things like Strike, which allows you to get a more stable currency in. And then there's things like Bitcoin, which allows you to, you know, get Bitcoin in. But then there's the issue of uh, it's more volatile and people might need the money there. And then, I mean, the first thing I'm thinking of, is there any... Uh, access to a Bitcoin exchange in Tonga? Do you have Bitcoin ATMs? Is there any way to convert Bitcoin into the local currency? Uh, the only way to convert Bitcoin into local currency is to find uh, Chinese vendors uh, who will accept it. So there's no formal exchange, but there are Chinese vendors who will accept it. So uh, I don't know how much you know about uh, China. Uh, so uh, the digital yuan is is uh, uh, still being rolled out. It's pretty much rolled out. Um, uh, before our country uh, had a full embassy in China, uh, my ex-wife and I were the honorary consulate uh, in in Beijing uh, for two years. So uh, even back then, uh, they use an app called WeChat, and mm -hmm. they act digitally in it. So when you come out of a bank or a subway station, the beggars sitting there asking for money don't have their hand out. Uh, they have a mobile phone out and ask you to hit them with a, a digital donation. So that's the case with all our Chinese uh, vendors who dominate 99% of the market. And uh, they will accept uh, Bitcoin, uh, a large number of them. So we've been able to uh, send uh, money back to warm wallets uh, and then have them accept it uh, uh, at, the, at the shop front, basically the way uh, you would use Strike in El Salvador. You turn so up. You can pay with it. Yeah, you turn up at the store and you can either cash out or you transact in it. Oh, uh, so they'll act as a broker and, and buy it from you? Precisely. So do, you know which is, do you know what kind of percent they're charging on that? Uh, no, not exactly, because it varies so widely. Because strictly speaking, uh, it's not 100% legal because, as you said, they're acting as a, a broker mm. uh, technically, but uh, in their eyes, they're just accepting... It's the same as accepting USD or AUD. They're just accepting another currency uh, for their goods. So they're the vendor. They have the right to decide uh, to decide if they accept uh, pieces of toilet paper in exchange for their goods. It's entirely up to them. So uh, it's not formally uh, a brokerage because if it were a brokerage, it would require financial services operator's licence. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah. But, yeah, it seems like to me it's like strike solves uh, an initial problem of, of killing the remittance and, and not having to worry too much about volatility. But also Bitcoin solves a, a problem that I've kind of recognised with El Salvador in that – uh, if you can get enough Bitcoin in the country on a long enough time frame, that that Bitcoin raises the net wealth of the country because it appreciates uh, it appreciates more than traditional currencies. If yeah. precisely exposure to Bitcoin the rails, uh, if if we were to adopt Strike and adopting Strike would really, in real terms, uh, only involve 
of um, everyone downloading an app on their phone and the points of sale downloading an app on the iPad or the Android tablet and accepting uh, the, the medium of exchange. It doesn't necessarily require an act of parliament or even um, uh, endorsement from the central bank, strictly speaking. I mean, if a Strike wanted to make an arrangement with uh, a financial institution so that they could work together for clearance, that's another matter. But just strictly to transact in, um, that would give us back that 19% uh, of the 40%. So uh, half uh, the 40% is worth 200 million. So the 19% is over 200 million. Uh, so the 19% is worth close to $100 million. Uh, so we're putting $100 million back in everyone's pockets just from exposing them to the rails uh, yeah. without even touching the asset. So the sender needs their bank account uh, to be connected, but the receiver, as you know, uh, can receive it as an unbanked person. Uh, and have it uh, with a participating storefront or cash point, uh, can have it given to them in uh, fiat or they can load it to a warm wallet. Exposure to the rails immediately gives that $100 million back. That's mm -hmm. without even touching Bitcoin, the asset. Yeah. And then uh, after a while, so... Getting that $100 million back basically means you're going to get $100 in your pocket when $100 is sent mm -hmm. instead of $70. So that extra $30, you're going to immediately spend to increase your standard of living. Uh, but after a while, as you said, as time goes, you'll remember that you got by on the 70 and it was hand to mouth, but you got by on the 70. And then you'll realise that the 30 is not just for raising your standard of living, it's giving you the first chance in your life to have savings. Mm. And therefore, they will event eventually begin to stack sets, as they say. And yeah. then, so the economy will first benefit by every customer having a disposal disposable income increased by 30%. And because our country imposes a 15% VAT, uh, every person is putting an extra 30% into that 15% that VAT because they've got extra 30% uh, disposable income just from the rails. That's amazing. And simultaneously with that extra 30%, there's, there's some are going to be saving it rather than putting it into the economy and stacking sats which will appreciate. And for the first time, someone who's a village fisherman and has been hand-to-mouth all his life has a glimpse at possibly having savings that might be the foundation for financial freedom. Wow. So we get a double whammy, just the rails and then the asset. So uh, funnily enough, uh, the developed world uh, went store of value first and then working through a medium of exchange with some hope of being unit of account. Uh, the, the developing world has gone medium of exchange first and then working towards store of value. Uh, so back to front, Bitcoin still works uh, seamlessly. You're obviously a connected guy there. You've obviously shown a lot of interest in this. You get it. You understand what's going on. How much have you been discussing this with your colleagues and peers and other people in Tonga? Uh, quite a lot. Quite a lot. Um, General I response? Just, uh, yeah, very positive response. Uh, I just had a session uh, yesterday, two days ago, uh, with our most uh, senior lord in parliament. Um, and, uh, yeah. Is 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 very keen. Uh, in a house of twenty six, uh, fourteen is a majority. Uh, the nobles always vote in a block. Uh, so where one goes, we all go. So that's a nine block vote. Uh, 
Uh, I understand three of my colleagues, uh, not I understand, I, I know pretty sure, uh, in the people's reps already have uh, contact with the asset through their own independent journeys. Okay. Uh, and that's three plus nine is 12 to make up 14. You only need two extra out of uh, 14 uh, MPs. Sounds like and, a lobbying. Uh, yeah, not just, no, not, not lobbying. Uh, yeah, just game, gaming it out. Uh, yeah. The lobbying's already been done. Well, it makes me uh, think so of... So that makes um, two out of 14. Yeah, I keep thinking of... Uh, have you ever watched the Abraham Lincoln film? The link, yeah, Lincoln. Yes. yes. Yeah, where they're working out the votes. What do we need? Exactly. Who do we get? Exactly. And what, do, what, um, what, do you, what legislation are you pushing for? What le- And like looking at what El Salvador has done, similar? Are you pushing for something similar? Le- like can Bitcoin become legal tender? Is that something you're considering? How far are you looking to take this? I, I think initially... Bitcoin the rails because that requires no legislative change mm-hmm. and no uh, uh, no sort of uh, breaching into the territory that the the Reserve Bank might feel is their is their purview. Mm-hmm. Uh, this can be done entirely commercially, and just the commercial solution provides an extra thirty uh, percent. Um, so. That will only require um, answering uh, Jack Mellis back for his very generous offer of help with some uh, hard data and details of uh, how to roll it out, um, what vendors you're going to need to talk to. Um, I'm not sure uh, if you're familiar with um, a company called Digicel. No. Uh, so uh, Digicel is a company out of Ireland that uh, has uh, most of its its uh, activity is in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. So what they do in uh, the developing world is they give out free handsets. They give out cheap uh, Chinese Android handsets because they're looking for 100% penetration. Right. Because they make their money on the credit top-ups. Mm-hmm. Uh, but more so on uh, digital fiat. So you can log on to their website in uh, London, in San Francisco, and enter your credit card details or your bank account details and send money directly uh, to a Tongan person's handset. And they've already rolled out the POS hardware through all the vendors to accept that digital fiat. So... You can turn up at a store, present the phone, uh, get cashed out in fiat or uh, spend the fiat there. So ironically, they've rolled out uh, the infrastructure to use Strike. So that's already there. So the commercial answer um, is just an extra uh, app on everyone's phone and an extra app on that hardware that Digicel has rolled out and is a conversation with the vendors. The next step is adoption. Now, what does adoption look like? Um, I, I personally uh, put great value in uh, uh, President uh, Bukele's uh, model and uh, the bill he's come up with. Uh, so all that would take uh, for presentation uh, in our parliament as a possible bill uh, is what's called a gap analysis. So uh, just going through our constitution and all our relevant legislation to make sure there are no contradictions. And where there are contradictions, uh, you make you amend uh, the new bill to make sure it aligns uh, with the current legislation. Uh, so that usually you'd send to the Attorney General's department that would get done over two or three months Um, I'm in hospital, I'm not doing too much, so I've done the first half last week and I'll finish the second half this week and have a bill that's ready for presentation uh, to the House. When do you think that's going to happen? Well, that's the question. Our borders are hard locked till March uh, 2022. It was initially until September uh, and then unfortunately Papua New Guinea right next to us in Fiji even closer, VG's a 40-minute flight. Uh, 
began getting 100 new COVID cases every 24 hours. Damn. So our Prime Minister, yeah, understandably, uh, was a bit uh, shocked and sort of taken aback. So they moved the, uh, the border opening until March. Um, as I said previously, we're, we're one of uh, the five nations that still have zero COVID, and that's because of the hard lock borders. Um, people in, in the country have sort of written to the papers and said, uh, what's going on with uh, our border uh, shutdown? Because we also have a national curfew. So despite the fact that the borders are already locked, just to be safe, uh, the Prime Minister and Cabinet have imposed the curfew from 11pm until dawn. So at 11pm, the army will come out and make sure everyone's off the streets uh, just to be safe. But there's no COVID anyway. So mm. people are sort of like, well, what's going on there? Uh, but our Prime Minister's also uh, an evangelical pastor. So... His response is, nothing good happens between 11 p.m. and 6 a.m., so you may as well be at home. <laughs> so, yeah. Wow. So the current uh, sitting of the House, the House rises uh, the second week of July, uh, and we usually have that. We do budget in June and then do July to August to do government's package of legislation for the year. Uh, we only sit usually about three months. And then because there's a, we would usually go till September, maybe October, there's a national general election in November. So we'll finish in August to allow them time to, uh, the people's reps time to campaign. Uh, but were I to get back in before the end of August, the bill's already ready to go. Uh, and as uh, you heard, uh, We've gamed out the numbers uh, and uh, our Prime Minister was the Auditor General in our country for 30 years uh, and he was the Auditor General in the late 90s uh, and early 2000s and the Prime Minister, I mean the King was our Prime Minister in the late 90s and early 2000s and they oversaw um, what austerity measures from a particular uh, group of people uh, did to our country. It gutted our economy. Um, uh, it caused uh, the social collapse, which resulted in the only riots ever in our history uh, because of the austerity measures. Mm. So the Prime Minister and the King, uh, I, can't, I won't speak to them, obviously, but uh, they will not be too... Uh, displeased to see the back of uh, a couple of those organisations uh, from uh, an enforced policy uh, standpoint, from a working relationship, of course, you remain uh, in, in, uh, on good terms and a good working relationship, uh, but no longer uh, with those sort of uh, uh, deep breach of the, the talents into your, your domestic policy and, and your society, which uh, not just we, but many countries in the world have proven hasn't been a, a greatly positive experience for us uh, uh, since the 90s. Yeah. So that being the case, uh, they won't be terribly upset with uh, a, a monetary system presented as an option uh, separate to that whole uh yeah, system. Yeah. Well, I think that's a, a, what a lot of countries are, are now looking at Bitcoin for and realizing. I think what Bukele has done in El Salvador is brave. You know, um, we don't know so how this is going to play for him. Uh, we don't know how this is going to play out for the country. I, I, I think, I personally feel it'll be positive, but yeah, it's not a smooth path. And yeah, those, uh, those exactly international institutions. Yeah, those international institutions. I'm we're not but sure I about them. How government works, yeah. Yeah. Well, you'll know better than me. Well, listen, look, uh, it's uh, it's getting very late here. <laughs> it's uh, 
I know. I'm sorry for keeping up for so long. No, no, it's fine. I want. I wanted to talk to you. It's just we we're on. Um, we're on very different time zones. We're almost the opposite. Yeah. yeah. So e- either way, it's either going to be my night or your morning or vice versa. So no, I'm, I was glad to do this. I, I kind of in my head, like because I like to travel. I'm just like, wow, well, I want to come to Tonga, but it sounds like I'm not going to be able You've to. You've got come to. For eight months, maybe. Yeah. Well, that's the exciting part is uh, when these plans became public. Mm. Uh, I suddenly got an offer of all these really generous offers of uh, uh, green energy solutions uh, with a view to Bitcoin mining. Um, Mm. So geothermal uh, energy solutions, uh, wave harnessing technology solutions. So they're geared towards Bitcoin mining, but they have a possibility to answer uh, power generation issues for us uh, nationally, absolutely uh, separate from Bitcoin mining. Uh, mm-hmm. We have generators from the 70s uh, that take diesel fuel, uh, the most expensive way to generate yeah. electricity. So, yeah, the, it's, it's, there have been some great offers and just off the back of um, the optimism around Bitcoin. So that's been great. Well, it's been great to uh, start to get to know you. Um, like I say, I hope I can get out there. I mean, it's one part of the world I've not, well, two parts of the world I've not been to is uh, Africa and Australasia. Um, uh, I need to come out. You'll love the surf, uh, yep. crystal clear waters, uh, white sandy beaches, literally the postcard. Or if you come up north, the furthest north, to my estate, my island, uh, the only populated volcano, freshwater lake, Choppy seas, uh, pull up a cabana. Anyone in the Bitcoin community is welcome. Well, listen, if I end up in the region, of course I'm going to come to your state. I'm going to come to your island. I need to go to Australia. I need to go to New Zealand. I need to go to the whole region. Sure. So I uh, I think that will be uh, in my plans for 2022. Well, listen, let's stay in touch. Let's keep talking about this. Keep me updated on what's happening. Please. I'm massively interested. And if I don't hear from you, I'm going to see you on Twitter spaces anyway most evenings. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to keep in touch directly, directly yeah. now. And oh, cool. uh, looking for more of these chats. Yeah, man, stay in touch. Anything you need, reach out. And uh, yeah, I'm sure I'll see you soon, brother. All right, I appreciate it, brother. By the way, this is Thank the this this is the second time I've done an interview half naked. I actually did one with, uh, but it wasn't video. I did one with Jun Seth and uh, Krista Rose about two years ago. We all just oh, we're all in a hotel it. and we all we all did it. So. You're not the first. Well, and June Seth is, and the boys are, are the guys you want to get naked around. And, <laughs> and have fun. All right, Lord. All right, well, brother. listen, look, good to talk to you. Take care, brother. See you soon. Absolute pleasure. Look after yourself, mate.